uh, with some of the old hymns that we used to sing in church as kids, as well as with some of the newer ones. So we're going to start this morning with Oh How I Love Jesus.
There's wonderful power in 
folks are going to be singing When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. <laughs> dismissed for Sunday school at this time. God bless you. Thanks to the workers and the volunteers for all that they do. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Kings chapter 22 and also 2 Chronicles chapter 34. We're going to be looking at these two books in those chapters. We're looking at the story of Josiah. We covered a lot of kings over the last little while. Uh, King David, Solomon, Asa, Hezekiah was last week, and today it's Josiah, and we learned something about each king, and we also learned something about ourselves, I, I hope, and then realize, well, we're like them in a lot of ways, maybe we're different, but when we come around God's word, and we have that focus, and we listen, and we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us, and we see the pages in the Bible, and the words that are there, and the story of a life, it's a living word, so God wants us to change. He wants us to be fashioned or molded by the Spirit of God as we focus on His Word and to become better. Not just better, I shouldn't say that. Spiritually mature, more Christ-like, more committed than ever before. Josiah stands out as one of the great kings. These two books and these chapters that we're going to look at tell us the story of this amazing king. And it's a great story to follow along. I'm going to be looking at a lot of verses this morning. I'll be tracking through those a little quicker, but the references will be on the screen. We'll be highlighting some as well. But there's two references, one of his beginning and then one of his last days that really captures who Josiah is, and it's there on the screen. 2 Kings 22, verse 1 and 2 says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Jediah, daughter of Adiah. Who was from Bozkath. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. Then later on, chapter 23, neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did, with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength in accordance 
with the law of Moses. When I was looking at the life of Josiah, I noticed that the writers focused on the age, different age stages of Josiah. And so that's how I'm going to build the message today, to journey and track with this young man who was one of the great kings. So the author tells the story at certain ages. Age 8 was the boy king. Age 16, seek the Lord. Age 20, remove the idols. Age 26, to restore worship, to renew the covenant, and then to remain faithful. He died at age 39. That's a young age. So we're going to look at the ages and stages, and we're going to put them on the screen there. Seek the Lord, remove the idols, restore the worship, renew the covenant, remain faithful. Amazing milestones of the great king Josiah. And as I was typing these out, you know what? I thought, that sounds like a spiritual common sense plan. Good for Judah, good for Canada. I thought, that's what we need to focus on. Not just ourselves, but even as a nation. And then, as scripture says, when we humble ourselves, then revival will come as we focus in on God. So, different stages. The first one is age eight. You probably can't remember when you were born. You are told when you were born. But from Josiah's birth to age eight, that's where it starts. Age eight, that's an early age because that was the mark he became king. And Josiah was the youngest king ever. Just think, what would an eight-year-old be thinking today? What would their interests be? Well, they have fun, toys, eat lots of chips and pop, video games, biking, collecting cards, watching TV, maybe cell phones, computers, but definitely not leading a country. And here Josiah is, eight years old, leading the country. He becomes the earliest or the youngest king. Now, his father, Amon, was assassinated two years into his reign, and he was a poor example of what it meant to be a follower of God. Actually, he didn't follow God. He rebelled against God, did his own thing. It's interesting that Amon's father was Manasseh, and we touched base on him last week a bit. Manasseh was one of the worst kings. So you could say that Amon was a chip off the old block. He was cut from the same cloth. Now Manasseh's story was terrible for most of his life, and then God brought him back. He repented, and he started to turn his life around and bring some reforms to the nation, but it was, it was too much too late. So Interesting, Manasseh, who had a turnaround at the end, didn't have a godly influence on Amon. And Amon just did his thing and went down deep, a deep dive into apostasy and following all the other gods and just trying to institute worship, desecrating God's temple. That is the background that Josiah stepped into at the age of eight. That was his lineage, his heritage. That was his father and his grandfather, the influences that were all around, not just in the nation, but also in the house. You'd think that Josiah wouldn't have a hope, that there wouldn't be a chance. And he's eight, and he's a king, and there's lots of pressure on him. So here's the question. We've looked at his grandfather Manasseh and his father Ammon, and they were just terrible, wicked examples, some of the worst kings. Who then were the good and godly influences in Josiah's life that he would turn out different? We have to ask ourselves the question because that's what Scripture says. Well, usually the mothers were not included in the lineage or introduction of the next king, but in Josiah's case, his mother Jediah, daughter of Adiah, is mentioned. Never underestimate the power, love, and example of a Christian mom. So she had a, a good and godly influence. Perhaps there are more who shaped Josiah's life from birth to age 8 and onward till he was 16. The Bible mentions Hilkiah, the priest, and Shaphan, the secretary. And these two men were mentioned quite often in these two books and in the chapters. So they too had an influence on his life. Now maybe you didn't have a good upbringing. We mentioned that last week. But maybe there's some mothers that have really shaped you and, and helped you in your journey as a young person Maybe your parents weren't living for the Lord. Maybe you didn't have a praying grandparent. But maybe there's an uncle or an aunt or a friend of the family and they just encouraged you. They came alongside you. They lived out their faith before you and you saw it and you knew that it was real. Never underestimate the power of a godly influence on a young person. It's never wasted. Josiah responded to the good godly examples in his life. The next stage is this, age 16. And it's there in the scriptures, and you can follow along. He started to seek the Lord. He began to seek the Lord. See, there's a growth that's happening there. Age eight, he has all the pressure of the kingdom, but there's good people in his life. 
So he's getting older. And, and again, think of what does a 16-year-old today think of? What are his priorities? Well, it's probably girls and cars and sports, music, entertainment, having fun and all that kind of stuff. But here Josiah is seeking the Lord that was most important to him. Again, it's an investment in the young life and we see the growth happening that he's getting at that stage where he's owning it. He's not just seeing the examples, but he's making those decisions. This is how I'm going to live. And this is the difference that I want to make in this life. I'm going to make my mark. So he began to seek the Lord. Don't leave it till the end. Do it now. And if you're young people, and I know they're downstairs, but if there's any teenagers in their 20s, start seeking the Lord. Now, 2 Kings 22, verse 2 says, He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father David, not turning to the right or to the left. He did what was right, not in the eyes of man or political correctness or being woke or, or intellectual pressure, but in the eyes of God. And that made all the difference. God takes notice how we live, how we walk and talk, and are we right with God. And then it says, and followed completely the ways of his father, not Ammon, not Manasseh, but David. Not turning aside to the right or to the left. That's quite the description of a young person who's 16, isn't it? I mean, children shouldn't be embarrassed about their faith. They can be an example to us older people when they start living their life for the Lord. So as we encourage them, they encourage us. So he followed the example completely about his father, David. David was the standard, a 10 in God's eyes. And we're to please God, and Josiah wanted to do that, to please God and live like David did and follow his example. 2 Chronicles 34, verse 3 says, In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. What a great start. I'm thankful for my Christian upbringing. The songs, the Sunday school lessons, the scriptures, the prayers, an example of my parents. But I had to make a decision for myself to own my faith and invite Jesus into my heart and take responsibility for my life. And my parents continued to encourage me, my Sunday school teachers and youth leaders and pastors. And going to church was so important to me. And I thank God for all those influences. But a person can be surrounded by church and all the activities, and still miss out on that personal relationship. Josiah began to seek the Lord more than anything else. He wanted to know God and serve Him. He didn't wait till he was older or more established as a king. He started when he was young. And it's never too late. No one is ever too young to take God seriously and to obey Him. And Josiah is proof of that. Next thing, at age 20, he starts removing the idols. After seeking God, growing his faith and role as a king, he knew that he'd have to make some definite reforms if he was to follow the Lord. He came into his own skin, you can say. So scripture says, in his 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, Asherah poles, and idols. Those are images of, and every symbol of idolatry. In Josiah's time, there were more idols than towns in Judah. That's a lot of idols. They were surrounded, they were deep. The idols were accessible, they were visible, they were all over the place. And yet we find in Scripture the Word of God was hidden in the temple. They didn't have it. They didn't read it. They didn't care about it. No wonder the people were lost. So 2 Chronicles 34, verse 3 to 7, if you have your Bible, is going to read a lengthy portion here. In his twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, Asherah poles, and idols. Under his direction, the altars of the Baals were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them, smashed the Asherah poles and the idols, these he broke to pieces and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He burned the bones of the priests on their altars, and so he purged Judah and Jerusalem. In the towns of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, as far as Naphtali, and in the ruins around them, he tore down the altars and the Asherah poles and crushed the idols to powder and cut to pieces all the incense altars throughout Israel. Then he went back to Jerusalem. This is between the ages of 20 and 26. That, that took a lot of courage boldness, determination, and commitment that he would start doing that, just wiping out any traces of idolatry. He was like a one-man wrecking crew. Good for Josiah, how different he was from his parents and his grandparents. He was making a difference. Destroy the altars, 
in the idols so completely that he ground to dust so they can never be used again. Imagine those who are watching this, who are steeped in all this idolatry, who are not living for God, and they're seeing this outward reform happening. Maybe they thought, like Josiah, like, have you lost your bearing? You're not like Ammon. You're not like Manasseh. Why don't you just leave us be? What are you doing with our lives, with our nation? Why are you wasting your time following God doing all of these things? And what brought him through this time that he would still stay, stay so focused was he was seeking the Lord. The relationship with God is the most important thing about you. And it makes a difference. He was intense. He was passionate. He was determined. He was committed. And if he didn't do it, who would? Well, certainly it wasn't his father, was it? Or his grandfather. And even though he was young, he could do it because he was following God and God was with him. Idolatry. Let's just stop for a moment. What is that? Adultery is anything or anyone that comes to take place, the place of God in your life. Could be giving all of your devotion or time and energy into a relationship, into work, into a possession, into an activity or a leisure or a sport, more so than God. So you could be living idolatrously, just like in Josiah's time. Maybe you don't have a physical God, but your heart is divided and, and you're not living for God as you should. Other things, other relationships are more important. Adultery is a Western society problem too. Times haven't changed. People haven't changed. Well, the next stage in age is age 26. He restores the worship. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 3. And I hope you can track and see this, this little 8-year-old becoming a 16-year-old and 20-year-old and then a full-grown man, 26. He's restoring the worship. 2 Kings 22, verse 3. In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent the secretary, Stephan, son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, to the temple of the Lord. He said, go to Hilkiah, the priest, and, get, and have him get ready the money that has been brought into the temple of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. Have them entrusted to the men appointed to supervise the work on the temple. And have these men play, pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, the builders, and the masons. Also have them purchase timber and dress stone to repair the temple. But they need not account for the money entrusted to them because they are honest in their dealings. So he's repairing the temple. He's paying the workers. Money has been raised. He's, he's treating them fairly and they're honest and they're hardworking. And out of that renovation of the temple, he's, he's cleaned out all the adultery all over the place, but he's focusing on the temple now. Hilkiah the priest said to Stephan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. It's most likely the full Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. So in his 18th year of serving at age 26, he discovers the Bible. It means he didn't have it before. Now the temple would be the obvious place to find it, right? But it was hidden there for whatever reason. Maybe to keep it safe as the kings sort of did their own thing. Maybe it had been forgotten when it was being built over three, four hundred years by Solomon and they took the one copy and they put it in one of those corner places to secure it. Whatever the reason, it was hidden. And if something was hidden, it didn't have the effect that it should have because people weren't reading it. It wasn't in their ears. It wasn't in their heart. You could just see that if you don't focus on the Word of God and live by its truths and allow the Holy Spirit to help you, you're going to be distracted just like the people of Josiah's time. And live for yourself instead of God. And I find it interesting that God's word was lost in the temple. You know, many of us have more than one Bible. Maybe you've had it on the shelf for a long time. Maybe you packed your Bibles in a box and you haven't read it. You're here today, which is great. Maybe you stored it away. Maybe you've forgotten about those Bibles. There's people who might get a Bible when they graduate high school or university, or when they get married. They get this Bible and they think, well, this is nice, what am I going to do with it? So they shelve it, and then as they move around places, it goes into a box and they never take it out. They've stored it away, but it doesn't affect them. It's so easy to be distracted in life, to have other goals and gods and dreams when you don't read God's Word. And Josiah's family was proof of that, and so was the nation. 
So let's again look at Scripture and let it speak for itself. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 8. He, that's Hilkiah, gave to Saphon, who read it. Then Shaphan the secretary went to the king and reported to him, Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book, and Shaphan read it from the present, in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkiah the priest, Achanam, son of Shaphan, Akbor, son of Micaiah. Shaphan the secretary and Isaiah, the king's attendant, go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. Hukai the priest, Achanam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Isaiah went to speak to the prophet Huldah, who was the wife of Shalom, son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the new quarter. She said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, tell the man who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says, I'm going to bring disaster on this place and its people according to everything written in the book the king has read. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused my anger by all the idols their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire me, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, that they should become a curse and be laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore I will gather you to your ancestors and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. Now picture it. Hilkiah finds the Bible. Shaphat brings it. They read it. The king hears it. It's like for the first time, in his response is he tears his robes. It gets him. It opens his eyes. He realizes how spiritually dry he is, even though he's doing so many good things in seeking the Lord. What was missing was this word. And it convicted him and it challenged him. And he realized, we have missed the mark so much. We have gone our own way as a nation. We're doing our own thing. We're lost. And he does something about it. See, age 16 to 26, he's doing all these outward reforms. He had good examples. He was following what David did. But he didn't have God's word at his fingertips. So he hears Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. Cursed is anyone who does not uphold the words of the law by carrying them out. And he's thinking, here's the next level. Here's what I need to keep growing and doing and serving the Lord. I have the words. Now, it's important. Here's his response. He humbled himself. When he heard the word of God, he humbled himself. He didn't make excuses. He didn't say, put it away. It's making me feel bad. He humbled himself. He tore his clothes. He inquired of the Lord. He said, go and ask someone else. Can any of this change? How should we respond? He didn't say, well, you know what? Let's just put it away. Let's hide it again. But but remember where we hid it. And let the next king deal with it. He he didn't say that. He didn't do that. He didn't minimize it. He didn't excuse it away. Instead, he said, we have to find out more. Go find someone who could tell us, who could speak for God. Is it too late? So the word comes back. It's not too late because you humbled yourself, because you tore your robes, because I could see into your heart, Josiah, God was saying, your life is going to be spared. It's not going to happen in your lifetime. It will still happen. That's the consequence. That was the judgment, but not in your lifetime. See, he responded to the word of God, and it affected him. It changed him. Charles Spurgeon said this, Visit many books, but live in the Bible. Visit many books, but live in the Bible. That's what Josiah was doing. He was living for God, but the the word of God came to life. It's like, wow, what am I going to do? How should I respond? He needed more people to help him. So Huldah directed him by God's Spirit. You know, the Word of God is so important. It's precious. You might have more than one. I encourage you, let it become, and it is that living Word, but the most important book that you read. His next response was this. He determined to follow God completely. Not half-heartedly. He didn't run away from God's Word. Instead, he wanted to follow through and to live it. 
Someone said God didn't give us his word to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. Has it changed your life? Does it keep on challenging you? Well, the next thing at age 26 and so longer stretch is he renews the covenant. 2 Kings 23, 1-3, Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, and all the people from the least to the greatest. He said in, all, he said in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the temple of the Lord. That's a lot of all. Do you get that? All the people, all the leaders from the least to the greatest and had all the words of the book of the covenant shared. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commandments, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in the book. Then all, again, the people pledged themselves to the covenant. What did these people do that led to a renewed fellowship with God, to a revival, to being restored. What were some of the things? Well, first thing is they renewed their promise. They did it together. They pledged themselves to the covenant. They, they realized they're heading in the wrong direction. They turned around. They came back. They wanted to get back on track with God and to serve Him and Him alone. They remembered His providence. The king, in 2 Kings 23, verse 21, gave the order, celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in the book of the covenant. Getting back to the forms of worship, getting back to what the Passover was all about. And this was huge. This is the first time that the Passover was correctly celebrated since before the time of David. That's over 300 years. When you don't remember, you forget. Remember that. When you don't remember, you forget. What am I saying? What is my point? Celebrating the Passover. Communion time, which we're going to do at the very end. When you don't act it, actively remember, you forget. For so many years, they forgot because they didn't remember. The Word of God was hidden. The kings were corrupt. The people, too, were following other nations. They completely forgot. They weren't doing the Passover. And this was the greatest Passover in years and years and years. See, the Passover was all about remembering God's help in ages past. It was all about recalling God's gracious and merciful deeds, the miracles for His people. They didn't deserve it, but God did it. How they spared them way back in Egypt and brought them out. And the significance of this act and the role is to help people renew their faith in God. Second Chronicles 34, verse 16. So at that time, the entire service of the Lord was carried out for the celebration of the Passover. And the offering of burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord, as King Josiah had ordered. The Israelites who were present celebrated the Passover at that time and observed the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. The Passover had not been observed like this in Israel since the days of the prophet Samuel. And none of the kings of Israel had ever celebrated such a Passover as did Josiah. All Judah and all Israel who were there with the people of Jerusalem. This Passover was celebrated in the 18th year of Josiah's reign. It was the greatest Passover. It was overdue. And God honored that. They were sincere. They realized with the word of God how far they were and they were coming back. When we celebrate communion, how far back can you go? remembering what he has done for you. Maybe the day of your salvation. Maybe you've been saved for years. Go all the way back through your life from maybe age eight all the way through and realize his goodness and his mercy, that he forgives, that he restores, that he heals, that he's with you, that he's faithful. When we take communion at the end of the service to reflect on God's goodness and your own need for him, and how you might have been living for yourself and you made some mistakes along the way, or you've hurt others, that we are to take a look inside, we're to ask for forgiveness, we're to forgive others. So we have that right attitude when we come together as communion. The act of remembrance is so we won't forget. Prepare your hearts even now for that and honor God. It's important to recount the story and to share our story with others because it's about God. Next thing is they reformed their practices. This was like the second round of reforms 
based on the word of God, not just the godly examples of others before him. When you read both accounts of 2 Kings and Chronicles, it gets a little confusing in the timeline. But now that Josiah has the word of God and he reads it, he says, oh, that's why I was doing it, but there's even more I need to do. The word of God was just burning within him. So he just went on a rampage and he did even more than before. And you can read about that. In those scriptures, I won't take the time this morning, but there's an interesting part. It says in verse 7, He tore, also tore down the quarters of the male shrine prostitutes that were in the temple of the Lord, the quarters where women did weaving for Asherah. There in the temple, there was houses for the male shrine prostitutes in the temple of God. That's how corrupt they were. So he tore those things down. Solomon was the one who built the temple, who had built shrines and other temples, places of worship for his wives, 342 years before. Remember, that was Solomon's weakness. He got led astray by the many wives and concubines that he married from all the different nations and their gods. And he would build those temples. Well, they became shrines for prostitution right there in the temple of God. Josiah, he brought all the priests from the towns of Judah and desecrated the high places. Uh, he killed the priests who had burned to all the other gods. He was making a statement. He was being thorough. He was going the distance. He left no stone unturned. He would take a look at tombstones. He said, whose are those? And if they were those who, who worshipped other gods, he would bring up those bones, grind them in powder, and put them on the temple of all the other idols. It's like, I'm making a statement. There's only one God, and there's only He. It's only He that we should worship. So he did that. Over all those years, he was making a difference. When you look at Scripture, you know, God has the plan for our lives. And when we follow through and we obey him, it's not by chance. God knows what he's doing. If you look at another Scripture, uh, it talks about fulfillment of prophecy. 1 Kings chapter 13, 2 uh, tells a prophecy of what was going to happen 350 years before it happened. And this is what Josiah is actually doing by grinding the bones and putting them on the altar. 1 Kings 13, 2, 350 years before Josiah does this, by the word of the Lord he cried out against the altar, 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 this is what the Lord says. A son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you he will sacrifice the priests of the high places who make offerings here, and human bones will be burned on you. Isn't that crazy? It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Fulfillment of prophecy. And Josiah is just doing his thing as he follows God, as he finds the hidden word of God, as he obeys it and follows through with all these reforms. It's a God thing. Started when he was eight, sought the Lord at 16, made reforms, renewed the covenant, found the word of God, and he follows through. Things are good. Things are as they should be. We can learn from his example. He rekindled their passion. See, it was about a relationship. It's not just about doing the right things, but it's about having that right relationship with God. 2 Kings 23, 25, Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength in accordance with all the law of Moses. The nation came back from the greatest decline and sin to the greatest revival. God was doing some amazing things. It's possible. Josiah was passionate about God, and it showed. And the people, too, followed God. It changed the nation for a generation. When we understand what God has done for us, let's not hide his words somewhere else. Let's hide it in our heart. Let's keep it safe, and we keep it safe by living it out, having that passion, living the Bible with the help of the Holy Spirit for God's glory. When we do that, there's going to be joy even in the most difficult times. There's going to be purpose. We're going to be focused. We're going to be making a difference. We're going to be salt and light in this world. And how many know we need to do that now more than ever before? He remained faithful and so did the people as long as Josiah lived. Second Chronicles 34 verse 33 says, Josiah removed all the detestable idols from all the territory belonging to the Israelites. And he had all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. As long as he lived, they did not fail to follow the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Lots of accomplishments. The last stage is his passing. He was 39, and he's killed in battle after reigning for 31 years. He failed to regard the warning of God and went foolishly into a battle that wasn't his. 
and so he lost his life. I guess it's just a reminder that we're still human. One thing when we look at the kings is they were all human. David was a great king, human. Solomon was so wise, human. Hezekiah, human. Josiah, human. They weren't perfect is what I'm trying to say. They had flaws and imperfections in their lives, and yet God still used them. Sometimes we think we're not worthy enough to make any difference, that we have to be perfect for God to use us. We see a great example that against all the odds, Josiah at a young age started to seek the Lord, allowed himself to be used by God, and he kept on growing in his faith. That can be you. Maybe you're not eight anymore, 20 or 26. Maybe you're way up there. It's funny how fast we get old, isn't it? But yet there's so much more living. Like I'm 58, I'm thinking I'm starting to get old. But then there's people in our congregation that are in their 80s and 90s and you're here and you're still serving the Lord, you're still passionate. I'm thinking, wow, I have another almost 30 years or more to catch up to you guys, but you encourage me that we can live each day for God. We can continue to make a difference. We can live out our faith. And how important is that? I hope I encourage you. You encourage me. And together we grow stronger as we honor the Lord and how we live. I want to encourage you to have that passion. Maybe that passion fizzles because you, you cool off in your relationship with God. Well, that's what communion is about. We remember what he's done for us. Reflect on our human condition and our need for him. We repent. But then we say, God, do your work in my life. I'm committing my life to you again. I need you. I want you. Help me to live for you. And he will. We're going to sing a song, I Have Decided. And I'm going to ask musicians to come back. If you haven't received your communion cup, feel free, even as the men come, to to go and get a cup. It's not going to throw me or anything. I'd rather, for those who want a cup, to grab one. Josiah, when he heard the word of God read, it touched him. It changed him even more, and he humbled himself. And he was more committed than ever. That's you and I as well. We could be in that place. You've heard the word of the Lord. I believe God is speaking to you. He didn't procrastinate. He didn't say, put it off for another day. There's repentance. There's restoration. God was gracious to to Josiah as he humbled himself. And he's gracious and merciful to you as well. You know, it's a great message of, of hope and redemption for each and every one of us. That God would take us as he finds us, forgives us and restores us, makes us brand new, and then puts his spirit within us to live for him. If there's anyone that is here that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, why don't you just admit that you're a sinner? Believe in Jesus Christ that he is who he is. Commit your life to him, saying, that's who I'm going to follow all the days, and make that decision every day for the rest of your life to live for him. He'll come in. The Bible says he'll make you a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. It's being spiritually born. And that's by faith because of his grace. So I want to encourage you in the quietness of this moment. And as the men just play quietly, I have decided to follow Jesus. We'll sing it at the end. And I'll even invite you to come to the front after communion and just find a place of of quiet. Maybe you're committing. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you just need encouragement. And you'll take that opportunity as we sing that song. And then I'll close. But God just doesn't give us his word just for our knowledge. He doesn't have a church, a building of people, a gathering of people, just so that we can have a hurrah. But he says, you're coming together for me, and I'm here for you. And I want to make all the difference in your world, so you can make all the difference in your world. And we can go out there to salt and light. I'm thankful for his word. I'm thankful for his Holy Spirit. I'm thankful for the time that we can gather, even now around community. So I'm just going to let the men or, or just Chris play that. Just quiet yourself. Close your eyes. Just let God deal with you at this point. Humble yourself before him. Ask for forgiveness. Name it. Give it to him, we pray. bread and I encourage you to do that so if you take the bread the 
book of Corinthians, there's instruction that Jesus had shared that time with the disciples before he went to the cross. And the bread represents the body of Jesus. That he gave up the splendor of heaven. He humbled himself. He became that body that would ultimately be the sacrifice on that cross. He was fully God and fully man. And this bread represents his humanity. He was still divine. Let's take this together. Father, I just thank you for your gift of Jesus Christ who came. He came a world out of his way to hang on that cross, to be that physical sacrifice for our sins. He went the distance. Thank you, Jesus, for Christmas. Thank you for Easter, the story that he was fulfilling why he came. He knew that a body was prepared for him to be that ultimate sacrifice. Let's take this juice representing his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And that's what this juice represents. The blood that flowed so freely. Let's take together. Jesus, thank you for the blood that flowed so freely. That it saves us completely, that the price has been paid, that there's hope for the whole world, but we have to make it personally, a decision, one person at a time. So thank you for this gift of salvation. I pray that it reaches someone today. I pray that there's someone who says, I want to become new. I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to become that new creation. I want to be new on the inside and let it show on the outside. Maybe there's some that were just dragging their feet and the guilt of shame and the decisions that they made and the fingers that were pointed even by themselves. I pray, oh God, that we would be encouraged today as Josiah was. If we humble ourselves, you will forgive us of our sins and you will help us by your spirit to live for you, not in our own strength, but in yours. I pray, oh God, that that would happen today, that your people would become stronger as we do this act of remembrance so we don't forget that we live for you instead of ourselves. We'll give you praise for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing this song I have decided. And if you just want a quiet time of prayer and you feel that you want to get away from your seat and just find a place of quiet prayer in the altar or, or to kneel at one of the chairs, why don't you do that? And then I'll close in prayer. If you have a specific need and you want us to anoint you with oil, I'm happy to do that and pray for you as well. So you take your opportunity to meet with God in whatever way you feel comfortable. God is here to meet with you. Let's sing it. And let's respond to him this morning before I close. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. living. It's active. It gets right to the point of who we are and how we should live. 
God, you find us the way we are this morning, but you do that difference, you do that change, you heal, you restore, you forgive. Because of your mercy and grace, you continue to be committed to us, to change us, to become more like Jesus Christ. I pray that that would happen in these next few moments, but also during the week, Lord. Pray, O oh God, your favor would rest upon each person, that they would trust you with their lives, that they would live out all their days for you in a way that would please you. We give you thanks for that. Be with each one as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like prayer for anything, you're welcome to come up to the front. We'll, we'll pray for you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.